Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning, brethren. Always so good. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 7. Only, our God speaking to Joshua, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Note, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Do not turn from my word to the left or to the right is a common admonishment throughout the pages of the Bible. And we see it played out. We see those who want to bind where God has not bound. And we see those who want to loose where God has not loosed. But we are commanded to not go there to either extreme, right or left, but to walk the line. You may be familiar with the symbol of yin and yang. It's on the flag of South Korea, where you have the swirl of black and the swirl of white. It's a philosophy of the East. The black represents chaos. You have chaos. And the other is order. And both extremes are epitomized by the little dot. You know, in the black swirl, I probably should have had a picture up there, sorry. In the black swirl, there's the little white dot. Because the epitome of chaos, chaos completely gone in, is a form of order. It's disorder as the form of order. And orderliness, the white with the little black dot, the epitome of orderliness is chaos. It is chaotic. Thus, in the Eastern world, you have chaos and order, and you have that sinewy line that runs between the two. And that is the way, the Tao, that they are to try to walk between chaos and between order. I see a similarity with Christians. We are not to turn to the right nor to the left, but we are to walk that line in between, the line of balance. One of the things the East Tennessee School of Preaching and Missions was known for was balance in an unbalanced world because we, people, mankind, tend to be extremists. We talked about in our Wednesday class, I think it was, but also in our Sunday Bible class, with regards to the Holy Spirit. There are those who want to put the Holy Spirit, to put Him into a box, because they're not comfortable with Him being free, being able to do things that they cannot understand or control. There are even some who go so far as to make the Bible the Holy Spirit. Well, that's one extreme. Well, what's the other extreme? There are those who say the Holy Spirit does everything. He's the one that had you wake up. He's the one that had you choose whatever you had for breakfast. He's the one that makes you say what you say. He's a, and they go too far, to the right or to the left. But the truth of the Holy Spirit lies in the middle. We talked about that and how we pursue that. We must walk that line, not turning to the right nor to the left. Many times in the Bible we've talked about, we come across things that seem to be contradictory. And it can make us stumble in our belief because surely the Bible doesn't contradict itself. We read that God is love, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. Amen? God is love. We read God is a consuming fire. Okay, well, which is it? The answer is, it's both. But you have to understand how to navigate that. To those that are His, who take Him as God and accept Him and, and follow and humble themselves before Him, He is love. And to those who do not, He will be a consuming fire. Uh, in one of uh, my um, bulletins a few weeks ago, talked about the great and terrible day of the Lord that is coming. What is great and terrible? Now, I, I know great can just mean 
big, but I've always taken as when the Lord comes again for many people, it's going to be a great day. We sing about there's a great day coming, a great day coming. And yet, unfortunately, for the overwhelming majority of people in the world, that's going to be a terrible day, a horrific day. Well, what's the difference? I don't understand. It's the same day. Well, the difference is in the minutia, in the details. That's the line we must walk. That's what I want to talk about this morning with regards to, to three seeming contradictions we see in the Bible. But then look in, looking into them, I want us to understand there's no contradiction. There's just a balance we must find in this walk, this, this line we are to walk. Don't come asking me about Johnny Cash. All I know is that I thought he wrote a song called Walk the Line, and I wanted to use that. So that's all I know. The Bible teaches us that we are to be striving. The Greek word, agonizomai, agonizing. And the Bible tells us we are to be content and rejoicing. I don't know about you, but when I am striving and agonizing over something, I'm not typically very content or rejoicing. Halfway through a squat workout back in the day, I'm not going, yippee! I am striving. But here's a little hint for you. The rejoicing comes later. But striving and contending, being content, are they contradictory? Luke 9.23, Jesus said, we're supposed to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow after him. Okay, that doesn't sound like a contentment thing. It doesn't sound like a joy. Here, let me deny myself, take up an instrument of torturous death, and be happy about it. How is that to be done? Luke 13, 24, when asked about how few are actually going to be saved, he said, you must strive to enter by the narrow gate. Again, agonizomai. Colossians 1, 28 through 29, Paul said that his ministry was warning all mankind and that to do that, he strove to do that. So he's striving to warn people, to get in their business and tell them the truth that they may save themselves and that he was agonizing over it. Jude 3, we are to contend earnestly for the faith. And the concept there is wrestling. We are to wrestle for the faith. And yet, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 24, Specifically in the ASV 1901 and the King James Version, it says, and a servant of God must not strive. Wait a minute. We, he just told us to strive. Now he's telling us not to strive. Titus 3.9, we're not to strive and get into strivings and contentions about words. He told us that we're supposed to contend for the faith earnestly. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, we're supposed to lead a quiet life, minding our own business, working with our hands. Wait, Paul said that he was getting into people's lives and warning all men, and we're supposed to do the same thing, so I, I don't understand. Is that a contradiction? Philippians 4, 6 through 9, rejoice, 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 and the God of peace will guard your heart, and God will give you that peace that surpasses all understanding. Which is it? What's the line we are to walk? Well, Jesus helped us to understand it greatly in Matthew 10 and verse 34. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Yes? The Prince of Peace said this, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And then he talked about that what he was bringing was going to divide families, children and parents, husband and wife. I thought he was the Prince of Peace. He said he didn't come to bring peace. John 14 and verse 27, he landed the plane a bit for us. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. 
not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The peace that Jesus gave us is not absence of strife. It is a peace that surpasses understanding because in the midst of strife and struggle and agonizing and contending earnestly, we can have peace and even be content. Because that concept, when I say content, God wants us to be content. What does that mean to you? Maybe, maybe it's just my bad um, understanding of that word, but when I think of the word content, I think of me about a half hour after Thanksgiving dinner. Very warm, very comfortable, very satisfied. I am content. Maybe even a little bit too content. But in Philippians 4, 10 through 13, what did Paul say that content meant? He said, when I have lots, half hour after Thanksgiving, I'm content. When I have nothing, I am content. What's the last thing he said there? I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. See, contentment, doesn't mean we have everything we want or need physically. It means that we understand the truth and the reality of our lives. And if we're thrown in prison because we are Christians, and if we're suffering in that prison, down in the lower prison, in the stocks, in pain, not being fed, in terrible environments, being ridiculed, this is after being beaten, how could Paul sing songs? How? Because he understood. His suffering was service to God, to the Christ who had died for him, that he might have everlasting life. The first time the apostles, after Jesus' ascension, the first time they were arrested and beaten, how did they go away from that beating? Moaning, complaining, those guys. They went away rejoicing that they had been found worthy to suffer for Christ. Contentment is this. Yes, I'm going through a hard time right now, but my God knows. He loves me. And no matter what happens on this earth, He has a reward in store for me that is worth everything. As Jesus said, would you trade the whole world for what God has for you? I hope not. Because it's passing away. So that line that we walk is that we are to strive, to work hard, to show ourselves approved. And yet, the more we understand, the more we look at ourselves through God's eyes, we understand that as we're striving, even though we fall short occasionally, God understands, God knows, God forgives. As long as we're striving. Because here's the balance again. Can I be perfect like Christ? No. Then I don't try. Well, if I don't try, I don't have the forgiveness through the blood of Christ. Okay, well, I'm going to try. But every time I fail, I'm going to hate myself so much and beat myself up so much that I ruin any kind of life I might have had. Kind of pulling a Judas. Is that what we should do? you got to walk the line. What's the line? 1 John chapter 1. If we walk in the light as He is in the light. Then we have continual cleansing. If we're walking in the light. If we're striving. Then we can be content knowing that all is ours. God is with us. Loves us. As Dennis was mentioning earlier, that beautiful Psalm 8 reference. He is mindful of us. He's got His eye on us. He's going to take care of us. When we know that, we can be content, as Paul said in Philippians 4, no matter what situation we find ourselves in. So, striving, content, contradiction? No. Need for deeper understanding. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be caring and concerned about our fellow man. And yet, 
not corrupted. Well, how do you walk that line? Romans 15, 2, I'm supposed to be mindful of other people. I'm supposed to live my life in such a way, not just to please myself, but to please others. Matthew 22, 39, part of the great commandment of loving God is that I have to love all mankind. Love them. And again, not a wish you well. I have to actively will and work their good. Galatians 6.10, I understand I'm supposed to do good to all men, especially, of course, the body of Christ, but to all people, I'm supposed to be working their good. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, Paul said he became all things to all men. Why? That he might by some means save some, maybe. To the weak, he became as weak. To the Jew, he became as a Jew. To the Gentile, as a Gentile. He became all things to all men. 1 Timothy 2, 4 and 2 Peter 3, 9. What is God's desire? That all men come to repentance because he's not willing that any should perish. So I need to be caring and thoughtful of everyone around me, desiring their best, not just desiring it, working it. How can I work it? Now, in many situations, all I can do is pray. All I can do is say, I wish they had better situations. But I have time in my life. God has given me means. He wants us to be conduits of his blessings. Like Abraham, you will be blessed and you are a blessing. He wants to bless the world through us. Are we seeking to do that? And how do we do that and still keep ourselves uncorrupt? James 1.27. We've got to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. How do I reach out to the world, striving to get involved in people in the world's lives that, that I might influence them to Christ and yet remain pure myself. Dennis mentioned this too. John 15, or excuse me, John 17, 15 through 17, the great prayer. Jesus said we got to walk the line. Don't go looking for it. He didn't use those words. <laughs> what he said was, we're in this world, and he doesn't want us out of this world, but we're not of this world. Do you see that? Well, if I'm in the world, I might as well just do what the world does. Well, not the worst things that the world does, but, you know, what's the big deal? No, we're also not, not in the world. We, it'd be wrong for us to remove ourselves like the, the monks of, I guess there still are monks, but I was going to say of yesteryear, to isolate ourselves into little communities where we just kind of have each other. That would be wrong. What we have to do is walk the line where we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Well, how, how, how do you do that? Brethren, with great difficulty. I want to reach out to this person. Um, they're, they're on my soccer team. Like I'd ever play soccer. But they're on, they're on my soccer team. And, um, and I want to reach out to them. So I say, hey, we should do something sometime so I can get to know them and, and maybe influence them to Christ. And they say, yeah, yeah, let's go. Let's go to a movie. That sounds like a great idea. What movie do you want to go to? They mention a movie that a Christian has no point, reason, being there. Well, what's the big deal, Rick? There's only just a couple, you know, 30 or 40 different curse words throughout the movie. No really bad ones. They only take the Lord's name in vain, you know, maybe 10 or 12 times. What's the big deal? There's no really active, uh, gratuitous scenes uh, of, of, uh, of love. So what's the big deal? The big deal is God has established a standard for virtue. And we ought to apply to it. And if we're trying to reach somebody and we compromise, we have lost what we were trying to do. We would have more influence by saying, no, I'm afraid I can't go to that movie. How about this other movie we watch? Well, why can't we go see this one? Well, they've just asked you to preach to them. They've just asked you to talk to them about Jesus. I'm a Christian. And Jesus says we're to keep ourselves pure. We're to guard our hearts and to guard our eyes and to guard our, our whole being from this, these kind of things. And, 
and I just don't want to be a part of that. Well, I don't want to be around you then. Hey, you know, that happens a lot. What's the alternative? Become corrupt, but just be less corrupt? No. You've got to walk that line. It's difficult. You understand that people know where we are Sundays and Wednesdays? Do you understand if we're not where we're supposed to be on those days that we've covered our lights? Because we've made a compromise. Well, Rick, you're saying I can't miss service because I'm sick? Of course you can. Of course you can. But just because you can miss service for being sick doesn't mean you can miss service for any reason you want. Let me rephrase that. God has given you a free gift. You can do whatever you want. But his people will be here when we're to be here. Come um, Ian, is that the hurricane? Come Ian or high water, we're going to be here. Why? Because this is where God's people are at those times. And the world should know it. Got to stand. Got to walk that line. Oh, but my family, they're not Christians, but my family's having a big get-together. Uh, I can be personal and tell you this story. And we're having a get-together, and it's Sunday night at 6 o'clock, and, uh, and my mama wants me there. Okay? My God wants me here. No, but I could influence her for... I think there's more influence by me being where I ought to be than me making the compromise. Because now I have taught not only my mother, not only my family, not only my brethren, most especially my children, church is important unless there's something else going on. That's a powerful lesson. Walk the line. How else do we not be corrupt? We never give up. There's a form of corruption when we get discouraged, then we quit. Just get tired. I look back at my Christian walk, which has not been that long. Whew, there was a bright fire early on. And then I've had a lot of introspection recently myself and shared it with my family. There came a time when my light started getting distinguished a bit. Extinguished, not distinguished. It should be distinguished. It became extinguished. I began not speaking up when I ought to brethren and to others because I just got tired of being that guy. Got tired of it. It's isolating. People hate you, dislike you. Ben gave that excellent Devo on Wednesday. I'm going to reach out in love to a brother or sister that's, that's struggling with their faith and not doing what they ought. I'm going to reach out in love and say something and they're going to hate me and ignore me and cut me out of their life and tell lies about me to everybody else. And it... Remember, when we start feeling boo-hoo, we talk to God and Jesus goes, really? People talk bad about you when you tried to do good. Hmm. I've been there, my son. Follow me. I've, I've jokingly told you, the last point, looking unto Jesus, when I became a Christian, I became a Christian that I might have forgiveness of my sins. Amen? Everlasting life. Amen? And, and to be called names and to be arrested and to be beaten and to be flailed and to be crucified. Wait a minute. I want the first part. I don't care much for the second part. Read 1 Peter sometime. Boy, what a punch in the face it is. For to such you were called. Persecution. You were called to this. No, no, no. Eternal life. Forgiveness. And persecution. Because what did Jesus say? I came to bring a sword. And if you take my sword upon you, it's going to divide your family and your friends and those around you. And you will find yourself in the extreme minority. That's the reality. Will you come or no? 
walk the line. Jesus is the perfect example in how to walk this line in all aspects. Always look unto him. Look at all that he suffered. Hebrews 12 starts by talking about, think about all those people that went before. All the things that happened to them. And then he gives that last list, right? Some of them were what? Some of them were stoned. Some of them were cut in twain. Uh, and they never received the promise. But they had that promise, the hope. It's difficult. Last one. Demanding and forgiving. We're supposed to be demanding not only with ourselves, but with one another in the church. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. I'm supposed to be taking what Jesus gave me. You're supposed to be taking what Jesus gave you. And I'm supposed to be transforming myself to the perfect man, which is Christ. And we are supposed to work together like a body where every part does its share that we may grow the body internally, spiritually, and externally, Lord willing. That's a lot of work. We're called to that. What's implicit in that is so that we won't be children anymore. So grow up. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Let all be done for edification. I love getting together with brethren. I tolerate throwing cornhole. Uh, I really enjoy playing volleyball or badminton at Jackie's house. Uh, we're looking forward, hopefully, to do some of that on the 29th. Um, love playing baseball. We did that long, long, many years ago. Uh, I love doing that stuff with the brethren. But you know what the number one thing I'm supposed to be doing with brethren let it all be done for edification. Even when we're doing those things, I should be edifying them with my language and with my behavior and with the things that I approve of or, or disapprove of. I missed a point, so I'm going to go back and deal with it. It has to do with this point, but I'm going to leave it on this slide. We have to be ever so careful that we do not put our approval on the corruption of the world. Because if we do that, we lose our influence. We can even lead others to sin. Brad Harrop posted on Facebook that paragon of virtue. Something that's been on my mind for a long time. This is what the title was. Grandparents, stop liking He's talking about Facebook. Facebook, if you don't know, blessed are you. Happy are you. Those who engage in Facebook, people will post up things that they've done, things that they're doing. And then other people will like it. Click a button and say, I like that. I like that. Or will make comments. I really like that. And yet, what are they liking often? Well, my granddaughter went to prom. And here's a picture of what she wore. The shame of it. And yet, what do we see? Christians. I like that. So pretty. Really? Dressed like that. Going to that venue. You approved of that. Or how about, look what we're doing. And you look at the time it was posted, and it's right in the middle of Sunday night service. You going to like it? That they weren't with the saints, that they were out bowling or doing something? What am I saying? I remember one time in Jamestown, one time in Jamestown, I had a friend request on Facebook from one of the young ladies in the congregation. How cute is that? She wants to have, be friends with her preacher. Only problem was I knew she was a year under the age when she could be on Facebook. Which means she had lied when she filled out the form to make the profile. Do I accept and approve of her lying? Rick, you're, you're taking this too far. Am I? 
walk that line. You decide, but I'll give you a hint. God's told us where the line is. Jesus helped sinners, but he never sinned with them. He was never with them when they were sinning. And he never, ever compromised the word or will of God one time. Demanding and forgiving. Sorry, now we're back to here. God demands that we build ourselves up in the word of God and that we shine as lights, that we be conformed to the image of his son. And then add to that all the discipline. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves, brethren, daily to make sure you're in the faith. Look into this Bible. Is that you? Better be. If not, change. And then there's the discipline that we're supposed to be within the church. Is there a brother or sister going wrong? You've got to go to them and, and, and address it in love. Well, they didn't listen to me. Take two or three more. Uh, I don't want... It's commanded. It's not a suggestion. Well, they didn't listen to us either. Then you bring it before the church. Well, it's really not that big a deal. Salvation, eternal life, not that big a deal. How am I supposed to take that demanding, that required commanded demanding, and add to that that God is forgiving and rich in mercy? Well, again, you got to walk the line. God often says, I am merciful, forgiving thousands but by no means excusing the guilty. Those who repent, those who say, I'm trying to work on this, and we see them actively trying to work on that, we forgive. Love does what? It overcomes that sin. Because they're working at it. I can be forgiven when they fail me, when they stumble. A brother does me wrong, and, and I bring it to his attention, and he says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, blessing. It's gone, and we're closer than we were before. That's how it's done, like Jesus did it. Does God forgive an unrepentant sin? He does not. Does God re 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 uh, forgive a repentant sin? Every time, and remembers it no more. So too we, brethren. How do we do it? Got to seek knowledge. Here's the line. Shows you the left, shows you the right, shows you the middle, shows people's lives living one or the other, and Jesus walk in the line perfectly. Gain that understanding, that balance, and then seeking the service in that way. Brethren, it's not easy. It's constantly struggling with yourself of, I want to please God. Here's what the world wants. How do I walk that line? We're going to give an answer for that. But I'll tell you this, brethren. If we try, if we strive, if that's what our heart desires, that line is right to heaven and no tears and nothing but joy. If you're not a Christian this morning, God calls you to himself. He can't just make sin go away. He's provided a way for you to have your sins forgiven. But you have to do what you are commanded to do. If you don't know what that is, talk to somebody. If you do know, why not this morning? We're not promised tomorrow. Live your lives right now because it's all that we have. And live righteously. Christians, we become a Christian and we find ourselves in this world of darkness constantly splattering mud everywhere. and We're supposed to keep these garments clean. How do we do it? Diligently. With help. Together. Unto heaven. If you haven't been doing that, turn back. If there's anything we can do to help you, we'd ask that you come forward as together we stand and sing.